you. Uh, I'm Jordan Mimran, chair of the Toronto Fashion Incubator. Uh, and this is Toronto uh, Fashion Innovators. Uh, awesome. Yeah, so our webinar is going to run for about 30 minutes and then we're going to do a quick Q&A at the very end. Um, so, I, you know, I'm thrilled to be speaking with uh, Tanya Taylor, a designer and creator of the Tanya Taylor Women's Wear brand based in New York. Uh, Tanya has dressed a range of inspirational modern women, including uh, former First Lady Michelle Obama, Gigi Hadid, Beyonce, uh, Kristen Wiig, among, amongst others. Uh, the collection is inclusive and offers sizes ranging from zero to 22 each and every season. Uh, raised in Toronto, Tanya grew up surrounded by three generations of fiercely ambitious women whose creative approach to fashion inspired her from an early age. Uh, she studied at McGill University, Central St. Martins, and Parsons. Tanya was nominated for CAFA's International Canadian Designer of the Year in 2016, and prior to that, in 2015, Tanya became an official member of uh, the CFDA and was awarded the USA Woolmark uh, Regional Prize in recognition of innovation in knitwear. Uh, on top of all the aspects of your professional life, Tanya, uh, you're also a wife and mother, and thank you so much for joining us today from your home in Toronto, uh, where I hear you've been living uh, for the past few months during the pandemic. Yes, uh, thanks for having me. I'm really happy to be here. Um, yes, came for the weekend, thought I was going to the National Ballet School Gala on a Thursday night, and um, packed enough clothes for two days, and now we've been here for you know, almost three months. So wow. it's, it's nice to be home. Wasn't planning on it, but I, I feel really happy to be in Toronto. Nice. Well, the weather is certainly nice and bright. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I know that's one of your uh, philosophies uh, and you love to uh, inspire women uh, with your use of color. Um, you know, pretty much every description I read about you includes the word, word optimistic. Is that your mm -hmm. motto? Yeah, I think it is. Um, I feel like I didn't really realize, but I did grow up with a very um, optimistic and um, kind of positive frame of mind kind of mom. And she really just taught me how to live life balancing art and commerce. She ran a company, a Canadian company with 5,000 employees, and she was the chairman of the board. But she'd come home and do like arts and crafts with me at night. And I think any challenge that I faced during life, she just really kind of gave me the skills to um, think about the positive side of it. And it's really helped during the pandemic to think about how to pivot as a fashion brand. And sure. um, yeah, I think it, it kind of was part of my childhood is how I grew up is just looking at the world that way. Yeah, and I noticed you have that background in finance um, from Miguel as well. Um, so yeah, uh, obviously that makes you more well-rounded in the, uh, the world of fashion. Uh, and I, I guess it, it's helpful during these times, you know, and, and yeah. during this really challenging times, uh, you're away from your team. Um, and you found a way to not only stay positive uh, during and optimistic, but pivot your business, as you said, to, su uh, to support frontline workers in both the U.S. Yeah. and Toronto. Uh, mm -hmm. Firstly, congratulations and, and thank you. Yeah. Uh, we all need a little inspiration. And I'd love to hear about uh, how you did that so quickly. Yeah, so we, um, we started work from home from our New York office. So we're 27 people. We're based at Union Square. Um, the team started with one person. So over the last couple of years, it's really grown. And um, we all started working from home. I think it was March 13th. And it became really apparent to me that the fashion industry had a responsibility knowing manufacturing and access to fabric to be able to start mobilizing and making PPE. Um, and we had never done that before. And I think that our team is always looking for a challenge and is pretty ambitious. So we um, found some local factories and we decided on Instagram to crowdsource funding mm -hmm. um, because as a small business in those first couple weeks, you get all of your canceled orders and you're kind of like, I don't know how you could necessarily support something like PPE production at that time. So it was really amazing to kind of reach out to our community 
And um, on Instagram, we raised thirty thousand dollars in um, about four days. Wow! And um, we made ten thousand uh, masks for New York City healthcare workers that were distributed recently. And we um, also then realized, being in Toronto, that Toronto is like a couple weeks behind New York in access to PPE and also just um, in the spread of coronavirus. So. Wow. I found a great um, Toronto factory and we've made 17,000 masks here that are being distributed to um, Ontario and Quebec hospitals. That's fantastic. Yeah. And uh, like, I know that the whole Toronto fashion community has really been coming together um, to yeah. help frontline workers, especially, and we're uh, uniquely positioned, as you mentioned, to do that kind of thing. So uh, it's really inspiring to hear all of these stories. And New York uh, too. Like I think yeah. one thing that's come out of this is yeah, that, around the world, absolutely. Yeah, and I think like the New York fashion industry at times has felt, you know, protectionist or like brands were competitive, and this has just eliminated all of those barriers. I think what's been a, like a silver lining in this pandemic is the open communication that people are seeking from each other and. I found that I can call, you know, one of our competitors, CEOs and be like, what are you doing about inventory? Like, what are you doing about shipping product in the fall? And everyone's willing everybody's to- Everybody's in the same boat, aren't they, you know? Yeah, and they all want to know how you're approaching it. There's no right answer. So I think that um, I see a lot of collaboration coming out of this. That's really positive. Great. Um, when you started your business, uh, you know, what was your vision for the brand um, and how has that changed significantly, like as a result of our current experience? Um, you know, I think most of the people that are listening right now are familiar uh, with the Tanya Taylor brand, but how would you best describe the aesthetic to someone, you know, who maybe can't see it right now? Um, yeah, so... Um... I, when I started the brand, I was 25 years old. I had just worked for Mary Kate and Ashley Olson for three years for Elizabeth and James. Um, and what was fascinating about that point in my life was it was the beginning of contemporary fashion, as you call it. And that was really fashion that someone my age could participate with. It was, you know, I looked up to brands like Stella McCartney and Prada, and I loved these female designers that really put art at the you know the kind of center of what they created but i couldn't afford that so i think what i i wanted to create myself was a very artful very happy um, empowering brand for girls my age um, and as i've grown up um, i think our age range has really expanded. And what I love so much about the brand is that it's definitely defined by print and by color and a femininity, but it's also um, something that my grandmother can wear, my niece can wear. Um, and it's, there's, a, there's a range and there's like a classic attitude. And I think when you speak to maybe some of the celebrities that have worn us, you see that and you're like, how does a Michelle Obama wear the same thing as Gigi Hadid? And it's that there's just the spirit of the women that wear us that's very um, expressive and they use fashion as a fun way of, you know, being playful um, and really have fun with how they're telling their story. Um, so, um, yeah, I think when I started it, I always knew that it needed to come from a personal instinctual place. Um, so I painted all the prints from day one and We've since had print designers kind of come on board and we've expanded that repertoire, but if you there's always a- enjoy uh, painting yourself? Oh, I love it. Yes, yeah. we, we've had to work on some prints during this pandemic time. And one of them I got to work on recently and it was just so, like, I love that. I wish I had more time to do that because at the beginning, that's what I spent a lot of my time doing. Right. Um, and so I just always think that there's a very kind of, yeah, personal place that the brands come from. And that's where I started it eight years ago with one employee. And um, we have since really kind of figured out how what matters to me is really making women happy. And I think that it's not doesn't have to be just through clothing. I think we've really kind of brought in philanthropy as being a, an important part of the brand. We've taken our prints 
and redesign like pediatric floors of hospitals. We've done um, a lot of like color therapy classes now. And so there's more, you know. So I was, like I wanted to ask you, cause I know, you know, you believe in, in color and as you mentioned, inspiring women to live in color. Um, and, and I wanted you to explain a little bit more about um, color therapy and how you've been engaging your community during this difficult time with uh, specifically color therapy. Yeah, so color therapy started about three years ago and it really started from, a, I'd love to be an art teacher when I'm like eight years old. I'd love like a long gray braid and just like teach art. So I was like, well, let's start now. Um, so we, we actually hosted our first color therapy class at Christie's in Beverly Hills. And it was for 50 people in the middle of the gallery. And we had them um, walk through memory, um, their memories of their life in terms of color. Oh, wow. So I would say, you know, pick the, mix the color of your first kiss. And everyone would think about what that kiss felt like and what the color was that was associated with it and they paint their canvas. You know, the color of your, someone you love. Anyways, you go through about 20 prompts. And what's really amazing is physically when we host these classes, everyone stands up at the end, walks around and gets to see kind of the canvas or like color book of right. each other's life, um, which is really special because they've all heard the same thing. And during the pandemic, we've been figuring out how do we pivot and offer that to our audience for them to do at home. And so we've created kind of digital templates of, you know, fill this in with the color of, you know, happiness. Wow, and that's great. We'll, we'll really engage. And I think we've, you know, reached out to a lot of press to host these classes. So like Saks hosted one, The Cut hosted one. Um, and you just get hundreds of submissions of people's art. And it's really, really cool. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I love that a lot of people are trying to find uh, time, uh, stuff to do during their time right now. Uh, and it's great to find mindful things to do as well. Uh, Definitely. Know, and not just busy, busy stuff. Um, but, you know, speaking of uh, uh, your collection as well, you know, I know for fall uh, 20, uh, fall winter 2020, uh, you decided not to do a traditional fashion show at New York Fashion Week. Uh, what do you think the future is for fashion weeks and fashion shows? And do you think that they'll, there will, uh, that they're even relevant anymore in our post COVID world? You know? Yeah. It's something we're talking about a lot right now. So in February, we decided to not have a show. We instead picked five of our favorite female comedians and we had an incredible comedic writer put together scripts that kind of poked fun at Fashion Week. Um, and where that came from was most of my girlfriends don't work in fashion. Right. They don't know why I don't talk to them that week. They're really confused as to why it's so stressful. Yeah, yeah. And I think that they represent our customer. Like our customer is not only a fashion girl and she is she's frustrated by not being able to buy the clothes that she's seen during that time. and she's frustrated at why it's not an approachable event. Because, right, I understand that, yeah. Yeah, and so I think the videos were a really interesting digital way to kind of get closer to a customer and show them something that made them laugh. Yeah. Um, and then I think we're really rethinking, it's, it's amazing that we tried that before coronavirus because we got to kind of get a sense of like how you create um, impact outside of having a physical event. Um, but yeah, going forward, I think the biggest thing we're focused on is showing collections closer to when they're available in stores um, and not having that six to seven, you know, six month leg of a customer seeing it, then seeing it on Instagram a ton of times and then being exhausted by it versus showing it to them and having an avenue that they can engage with it. And having the selling season and the, the showing season sort of align a little bit yeah. better. Right. And yeah. That's, and, of, and, that's yeah. what like there's a lot of kind of recommendations coming from the CFDA or business or like British Fashion Council. Um, and there's a website called rewiring.org where Tim Blanks put together kind of his findings from a lot of designers and what they're suggesting. And it would be, you know, show spring in February, ship spring in February, like mm -hmm. have it kind of not, you know, have that availability. 
Um, and I think that that would work for everyone's business. It really helps with markdowns. It really helps with, um, you know, just consumer fatigue um, and being a little bit more accurate about when people want things. Yeah, yeah that's great advice, actually. You know, you don't always have to um, follow the, the market trends if it, if it doesn't serve you, right? Right. Um, it's amazing to me how much um, the coronavirus has pushed a lot of uh, all of this forward uh, that yeah. much faster. So, uh, you know, certainly, yeah, the world is moving faster and so is the, the fashion industry. And we have to uh, sort of keep up right and, and be able to uh, service our customers the right way. So, yeah. And I think that a lot of businesses are really honest right now. Like they like Gucci yesterday, like you know, for Alessandro to come forward and say like, I'm not going to be ready to show a spring collection in September is a big statement from a very large fashion house. And right. I think that that sets the stage for smaller brands to not feel like they're on a hamster wheel anymore, mm -hmm. but they can really kind of take the time and as he put it, like add oxygen to your creative process. And I think that that's really important that everyone realizes that's the priority right now. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, I guess that's how you see, like, how do, you, how do you see this as an impact on the industry as a whole? I guess that's um, sort of the silver lining in this is that maybe smaller businesses have more of a chance to compete at that level. Um, I think so. Yeah, yeah, I think smaller businesses, like the, the, the special storytelling behind smaller businesses are it will stand out to customers. I think that um, wholesale department stores are going to move away from like heavily inventoried, heavily merchandised, monotonous product and start to really think about what makes Saks different than Neiman's than different than Nordstrom in terms of the brand matrix, their customer experience. And we sell to all of those majors. And I think that it'll benefit us as a small brand to, to have a differentiated experience between them. But I think for us, what um, feels like the benefit of the industry is just a little slowing, like it's slowing down a bit where, you know, the push was always to ship every month and to have 12 deliveries a year. And now it's really focused on eight deliveries a year. So that allows teams to have more time for production and more time for design. And I think that that will show in a customer wanting to spend full price. Do you think your designs maybe would benefit from that extra bit of um, time uh, to develop? And, and yeah. you know, maybe collections will become a little more um, thoughtful or, or, you know, will have a chance to edit, uh, designers can edit themselves a little bit more. Yeah, or I think the benefit is that you will have more time to see what works. Like, right. instead of constantly creating and not learning, which is what the industry was kind of getting into, I feel like by spacing out collections, you're able to see, oh my gosh, everyone loves that dress shape. Why don't I just bring that back in this new print? Or why don't I ask them if they want it short? And you get to kind of react to um, feedback. And I feel like that's the most important element of growing. Yes, totally. Um, and I know you believe strongly in mentorship. Uh, mm -hmm. one, of, one of the Toronto Fashion Incubator's key roles is to provide that kind of mentorship to its members. Uh, while we, we normally do uh, that on a one-on-one -on -one basis, what would your advice be to the group, particularly during a time that is uh, uh, clearly, you know, uh, clearly seeing a lot of changes? Um, I guess it depends on where they're at with their businesses or what they create, but um, what I'm seeing work, and I think it could work at any scale, is to create personal product that you ask feedback on. So, um, you know, for example, with masks, like we were creating a, a cotton mask. And last week we were noticing a lot of people were wearing Jersey masks and we started polling Instagram, who likes Jersey, who likes cotton? And with hundreds and hundreds of submissions, you realize, okay, 68% of people like cotton. Let's just keep doing cotton. And 
I feel like for me, take out, like, ask people what they're looking for and what will make them happy and then figure out how you can make that. Um, yeah, that's, that's great advice. Um, you know, and back to the mass, I'm curious, it does, is there uh, benefits? Like, do you explore, um, material benefits now that you're into masks um like are you putting on a different hat that's more of a medical uh kind of hat and, and looking at the benefits of what one fabric might have over another definitely and i feel like i've been included on all these calls with like medical experts around fabrics and manufacturing and it's so over my head but i've learned so much um and yeah, we like we're following the CDC guidelines on which fabrics and construction is the most um, safe, but uh, definitely always in research mode of what's coming next because I think it's going to be an accessory that people will need for a long time. But also, I think it gives an opportunity that it's it can create a lot of anxiety and scare people to put one on. How do you make it the happiest it can be? And um, that's kind of the way that we're approaching it. Yeah, um, f for sure. And it's, I mean, it's definitely the accessory of 2020, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, um, well, thanks so much. You know, uh, right now we've got about um, 60 people, uh, 60 members watching, and uh, I know they're really enjoying the discussion. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Anyone yeah, has? I think it's a good time to switch over to some question and answer. So if you have a question for Tanya, please uh, enter it into the question answer um, panel at the bottom of your screen. Um, and I've got one here uh, from Deirdre. Uh, what was the first thing you did when you started your own line and where do you suggest I begin? First thing I did um, was I had no office and I had a meeting at Starbucks with my one employee <laughs> um, and we figured out how to get a phone. Um, that's the real answer. But I think yeah. I, the first thing I did is I, I asked myself, what are you going to do that's different than what's out there? Um, so I really took a look at kind of the landscape of New York and fashion designers and tried to figure out like where I fit in and what I wanted to do that was different. So I built a business plan um, that took me about three to four months and it, you know, showed my like, you know, my brand positioning, it spoke to price point, it spoke to like ideal distribution, but I did a lot of this on my own. Um, and I think that that naivety of like calling up Saks or Bergdorf Goodman and just saying like, come see my collection was a really, um, was a huge benefit at the beginning because now I'm like petrified to do the, some of that stuff. But at the beginning, I didn't realize that I should be scared. Right. Um, so I would say be very brave and ask for help um, and know what you want. Like walk into a store and say, I know you sell these brands, but like I create something that looks like this. And I think there's a need for it. Like if you're not willing to buy it right away, could I have a trunk show? Could I show you that I could drive sales by bringing my customer base to your store? And um, I think once I got in the door with some of the retailers and showed success, that was really a helpful way to propel. Right? Yeah. And showing, I guess, how you can add value to them as well. Exactly. Right? It's all about like them. Like it's not about necessarily you <laughs> yeah great we have another one um what was it like styling michelle obama does she shop off the rack <laughs> um that was working with her was probably the best experience of my career um we dressed her about 13 or 14 times while she was in the white house um most of it was custom and it was very inspiring. I think that, you know, she wore us for some really important moments and always wore print and color. And um, it made us just like the team couldn't be happier when we were working on something for her. Nice. And I got to I got to go to the White House and meet her, which was really exciting. Must and have been really special, yeah. 
Yeah. Oh, so and your mom came with you. Amazing. Yes. They had a, the, the Obamas had a big like blowout party at the end of their time in the White House. And my husband desperately wanted to go. And my mom kiboshed that and said, I'm taking the invite and went. And it was a party that started at 10 p.m. and it went to like 5 a.m. Oh, wow. And it would have been better for the husband to be there. Uh, <laughs> yeah. like, I don't know what's going on. There's too many, like, she didn't know any of the famous people, which I, I needed, I needed a, a partner to talk about with. Right. Exactly. <laughs> next time. Next yeah. Time. Next time. Yeah. Um, how do you feel? Uh, this is a question from Pamela. How do you feel about size inclusivity within the fashion marketplace and its impact in this new normal marketplace? Um, I think that the, I think there are more and more brands offering size inclusivity. I couldn't be happier about that. I think there should be more. Um, I think the way that retailers have handled it is really, um, impressive because they've eliminated the differences, which is what needed to happen. So a lot of the time, you know, extended sizing was on one floor and standard sizing was on another floor. So imagine two friends going shopping and they had to go to different floors. Like it just didn't make any sense. And I think what has happened is um, through marketing, through editorial imagery, through retail, they have, there's been a lot of great progress of showing that th that girl is, can be the same girl. It can be um, someone who loves the same styles and, um, that's what our brand really cares about. I love talking about how, you know, our fit model is in her early twenties and she loves short skirts and she's a size 18 and she is fit. And there's like a really positive energy behind size inclusivity now. All right. Great. Um, Stephanie wants to know, uh, what is your opinion, uh, between traditional and privately funded fashion schools, which would you recommend? Hmm. Um, I, I, I feel like the, I went to Parsons, which is a privately funded fashion school. Um, and to me, it was all about the teachers. Like it's not necessarily the, um, like which school you go to, but I would say like spending some time at the school and knowing who your professors are, what their backgrounds were, whether they're aligned with your design aesthetic, um, that will make the biggest impact. Um, yeah. And the city it's in, I find is really important. So when I went to London, I just like love London. And I think that that made the experience of design more inspiring. Um, so think about kind of how to transplant yourself to be surrounded by people that'll inspire you. Great, uh, we're gonna do two more questions. Okay. Um, uh, this one's from Derek. Uh, what do you think are the challenges for business uh, if we see if we switch to see now, buy now? Um, you have to predict what people want um, before you have a read on it before you go into production. So for example, Let's, let's say for this September, we produce our spring collection and we show it to retailers. That means that we don't show it to the public in September. So retailers place their orders. We place our orders and our bets for what our e-commerce business should look like. And then we show it to customers right before it's available in stores. What that takes out and what the risk that that adds is that customers haven't been able to give a response of what they love. And sometimes when we create something and we, you know, we put it on Instagram or we put it in an email newsletter, you get a direct read of like, oh, they love that print. Okay, let's cut 200 more units of it. And right. it's kind of on you to have that prediction. Um, but I think the benefit is that it'll be clo more closely aligned of when a customer wants it. And I think that's a better benefit than the risk. Mm -hmm. And um, related to your answer, our last question from Anne is how many pieces would you say would be a good amount to start a collection? And um, uh, how do you get a meeting to show it? <laughs> well, we'll start um, with the first part. I'd be pretty edited and really focus on like, let's say six to seven styles and then 
do color multipliers or fabric multipliers of those styles so that you really have you know your foundation set you're like to the, your buyer like this is my blazer this is my midi dress this is my short dress here's my one knitwear piece um define yourself in categories so that they know how they might grow you like they know what your kind of initial point of view is and then just do them in in multiple colors and i think that that saves a lot of money because the pattern making cost of developing a lot of styles is a huge investment at the beginning um, and then how do you get in front of people? You have to surprise them. I feel like you have to have very surprising, spontaneous, personal communication. Um, and you have to seem gutsy and you have to never stop trying. Um, one quick story, but like our first show was at the MoMA and it was because someone told me you have to have a show in New York somewhere that's surprising. And I had no connections with that museum. I had, I had no one, I didn't know anyone in New York. And so I just called all of their corporate sponsors on the website and begged them for like five months to give me an opportunity to use one of their like corporate party slots that they have to host a, an event at the museum. Nice. And JP Morgan was like, okay, fine. Just don't put naked girls in the museum and we're fine with it. <laughs> and that's how I got that first step in the door of like standing out and getting people to come to a show during fashion week when no one knows who you are. Mm -hmm. So I think just be bold. Yeah, great advice. Well, thank you so much for speaking with us today, Tanya. Uh, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. And uh, I know everyone at the Toronto Fashion Incubator appreciates your time. Um, you. you know, I hope you get to head back home soon and congratulations. Uh, we didn't talk about your, I know you're pregnant right now. Um, Very pregnant, yes. Yeah. So, uh, you know. Thank you. Uh, thanks again and uh, have a great afternoon in sunny Toronto. Thank you. And if anyone has any follow-up questions, they're welcome to DM us on Instagram and we're happy to answer. Oh, sounds great. Yeah, DM uh, Tanya or uh, email us at uh, the Toronto Fashion Incubator and we'll relay the, the questions. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Thanks again. Bye. Bye.